Hello everyone and welcome to a special episode of Code Emporium where we are going to talk about causal inferencing. I'm not going to be showing my face in this video because there is some technical detail that you don't need to be distracted by my face for, and so we'll get to it. But before that, please do hit that like for content like this. Please join us on Discord because we have a Discord server. Links are down in the description below. Do be a part of the community and we would love to have you. Subscribe for more and let's get back to the video. Before talking about causal inferencing, we need to talk about randomized control tests. We call these A-B tests in the industry, but I'll use randomized control tests here since each term makes more sense. I own an e-commerce store and I want to send out emails to individuals about our products, hoping that'll increase purchase conversion. But I don't know if these emails are going to help or hurt. And so I want to test this out with a randomized controlled test. This involves five steps. We first select the users to participate in the test, and ideally you'll select them based on a uniform criteria. Then we split these users into two groups evenly, and then we give one of the groups the emails and don't send the other group any email whatsoever. And then we monitor the purchase conversion for each user over time. And once the experiment is complete, or once the test is complete, we make decisions. Like, yes, the emails increase purchase conversion, or just the opposite. Now let's break down the phrase, a randomized controlled test. We're selecting users at random to be a part of the control group and the treatment group. This is because the only difference that we want between these two groups is just the fact that one receives emails and the other does not. If we quote unquote control the effects of other variables through randomization, we can then be confident that if the experiment says that sending email increases purchase conversion, then it is almost certainly true that sending emails indeed causes purchase conversion increase. And that's kind of why randomized control tests are so important and they can also be used for inferring causality. But there are many situations that we just cannot run these randomized control tests. One is that, well, setting up the experiment might be impossible. For example, instead of testing the efficacy of emails, what if I wanted to test the efficacy of billboard ads for my products? Now, you can't just randomly go to cities and set up billboards just for the sake of a test, and so this test setup is impossible. And another reason where we can't use these RCTs is because the experiment takes too long. And in order to combat this, it makes sense to make inferences based on historically observed data. So in this sense, we don't need to set anything up because the data already exists, and we also don't need to wait for any experiment time. Now, this is great, but observed data is messy, and randomized control tests are cool because we can control for variables that can affect our causal inference. And so if we're gonna perform causal inferencing on past data, we need to be able to somehow control for the other factors that plague the observations. Let's talk about three main challenges to causal inferencing. The first is confounders. I'm going to take a medical example for this. So the flu is a problem for the world and I developed an elixir that should cure the flu, but before releasing it to the public, I want to run a clinical trial. Now, this test isn't really hard to set up, and it's also not going to take an obscene amount of time, and so I can actually run an experiment or a test for this. So I take some users who have the flu and tell them to use the elixir, and they are my treatment group, and then I take another set of users who have the flu and give them a placebo, or rather just not treat them. And this is my control group. After a few weeks, I see that the number of people in the treatment group that recovered from the flu is way better than that of the control group. Now, this means that the elixir is actually working and causing the flu to go away, right? Well, not necessarily, because if we look at the experiment closely, I see my control group has an average age of 65, while the users in my treatment group have an average age of 35. This means that like the people in the treatment group probably could have recovered on their own, even without the elixir. But this test doesn't definitively prove that is the case. And in this example, 
age is a confounding variable. It's a variable that we haven't controlled for and that can have some causal effect on whether a person recovers. And this is exactly why when conducting A-B tests, we randomize in order to make sure that the age and also the other potential confounding variables are equal between the two groups. But like I said, in many cases, we cannot conduct a trial like this. And so confounding variables is a challenge in causal inferencing that uses prior data. You need to be vigilant of these confounders and control them too. Now, the second topic that I wanna to talk about is selection bias and confounders actually very well segue into this topic. So selection bias occurs when a group of users chosen for the treatment group isn't a good representation of all users in the population. This is exactly the case where, you know, the treatment only represents young people and is not really representative of the population. And so there is a selection bias here and we need to account for this when looking at prior data. The third challenge we need to account for is counterfactuals. Facts are truth. Counterfacts are what would have been the case had this person not received the elixir. When using prior data and also conducting a test, we need to compute counterfactuals for each individual. This is done just so that we have an apples to apples comparison. There are a few strategies that we can use to actually calculate these counterfactuals, like machine learning techniques, as well as a technique called matching. We'll take a look at this soon, very briefly. Let's now talk about some of the assumptions that we need to make for causality. So first off, why do we need to make assumptions? We want to tailor prior data to make it as representative as a randomized controlled test as much as possible. We need to make assumptions because there will always be some confounders that have some weird and unintended effects on the outcome that we simply will never control for. The assumptions make the problem of causal inferencing with past data possible. So first assumption here is the causal Markov condition. When doing causal analysis, we need to talk about causal graphs. Causal graphs are graphs with directed edges that show causation. For our medical example, we have a graph that kind of looks like this, but this is kind of convoluted. And so to simplify the causal graph to be a directed acyclic graph, we have confounding variables that have direct causal effect on the treatment and sickness outcome. And the treatment itself has an effect on the outcome, but there's nothing more than this. Another assumption that we make is SUTVA, which is a stable unit treatment value assumption. A sample in the control group doesn't affect the samples in the treatment group. That's basically what it says. This assumption is required to prevent any interaction effects. And for our medical example, this is true. We don't have people who receive the elixir influencing the people who don't have the elixir. And a third assumption that we're going to make is ignorability. This assumption says that there exists no additional confounders that has an effect on the treatment and the output. This is an extremely important assumption. Otherwise, even if we see the treatment group doing better, we wouldn't be able to pin a cause. Since the cause for getting well or getting sick could be pinned on potentially an unmeasured confounding variable. And so we assume we have no missing confounders. Since this is such an, a super important topic, I'm going to link more details down in the description below on discussion in Stack Exchange. So do check it out if you are interested in some more details. All right, so now let's get on to actually measuring the average treatment effect. Let's say that in our medical case, we want to answer the question, does the elixir make people feel better? We're working with some hypothetical data in this table. The first column is the person. The second and third columns is whether the person got better or not better, depending on whether they received the treatment. And so we only see one of these two columns being populated for a given sample. Ajay received the elixir and got better. Sam didn't get the elixir and also got better. The simple solution to answer the question, does the elixir make people better, would be, first of all, let's count the people who got the elixir and who also got better and divide it by the total number of people who took the elixir. This gives us 0.6 in this case. Next, we count the people who didn't get the elixir who got better and divided by the people who didn't get the elixir, which is 0.4. And then we subtract these numbers and this yields a positive 0.2.
So overall, this looks like the elixir has a positive effect, right? But there's a problem here. Let's add a column for age. Well, looky here, looks like the average age for those who receive the treatment is 48, while that of the control is only 29 and a half. Now that's a big enough difference that age could potentially be causing some effect on the output. And so, like we mentioned before, age is a confounding variable. To solve for this problem, we need to determine the counterfactuals for every person taken into account. And so we need to determine the spaces. The counterfactuals essentially say, for the people who received the elixir, would they have gotten better without it? Also, for the people who didn't receive the elixir, would they have gotten better with it? One way to do this is by matching. Essentially, you have to try to find people of the same age who received the other treatment and use that as the counterfactual estimate. So in this example here, Sam and Rondo are the same age and they receive different treatments. So if Sam received the treatment, we might see something similar like we did with Rondo and also vice versa. And this kind of makes sense. Another slightly more complex way that we can fill these spaces, that is determine the counterfactuals, is by using machine learning. That is like building a model that takes in age and treatment as the input and then predicts the output. We train it on factual data and try to predict the counterfactuals. I'd like to go over these two techniques probably a little more in a separate video, but for now, whatever technique we use, let's say the counterfactuals are populated as shown in red. To determine the average treatment effect, we subtract the case where the person got or would have gotten the treatment with the case where they had not gotten or would not have gotten the elixir treatment. This number is going to be the individual treatment effect, and we calculate this for every single individual. We then take the average of the individual treatment effects to get the average treatment effect. Now this final value is plus 0.1. So it looks like the elixir does indeed help even when accounting for age. Now, if I'm just looking at this one number, I would probably make a policy that says, for everyone who has the flu, let's just give them the elixir. Now, let's just see how true this actually holds up. So we have age as a confounding variable, and now let's determine the average treatment effect, which is conditioned on age. And this is known as the conditional average treatment effect. So the Kate will help us answer, how does the elixir affect people over the age of 35? And how does the elixir affect people under the age of 35? So for this, we would just average the individual treatment effects for those values of age greater than or equal to 35, and then also those values that are lower than 35. So the conditional average treatment effect where the age is greater than 35 is a positive 0.4, and that which is lower than 35, it's a negative 0.2. Hopefully the simple algebra is easy to understand here. So it's clear here that the treatment affects different age groups differently, and this is what we call treatment heterogeneity. And so based on the assumptions that we made on the causal graph, and based on the Kate values that we are seeing here, we can conclude that this elixir indeed does help older people or older patients get better from the flu but it doesn't seem to have a positive effect on younger people. So now looking at all of these values and based on all of these constraints, I would only prescribe the elixir to older people who have the flu and just let the younger people recover on their own. Note that we determine all of this without actually conducting a randomized controlled test and it's purely based on past observed data. All right, so Lots of things in this video in a short amount of time, so let's summarize what we did here. We first introduced randomized controlled tests and why we cannot always perform them, and hence we try to use causal analysis and causal inferencing that simulates randomized controlled tests based on past data. We then talked about the challenges in trying to make the past data behave as a randomized controlled test, like the presence of confounders, which leads to selection bias, and also the need for counterfactuals. Then we talked about the assumptions required for causal inferencing, and with a medical example, we showed how to determine the average treatment effect to definitively prove that a treatment 
has an effect on the output. And then we also looked at the effect of the treatment conditioned on different age groups to make better decisions. That's all we have for this video. There's so much more that I wanna talk about in causal inferencing, and I'm going to make a separate playlist on the topic. And so stay tuned for more. And until then, hit that like, please subscribe for more weekly uploads from yours truly, and join us on Discord for some fun. We'd love to have you, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.